good morning everyone so uh, welcome to the morning session of chobi mela so from today onwards for next four days we are going to have morning lecture series and today we are ha having two lectures uh, the first le lecture uh, will be by samun zamir associate dean of arts and humanities uh, associate professor of literature and visual studies program head visual arts new york university abu dhabi uh, and Shamun is going to talk about Edward Curtis and cross-cultural encounters. Uh, for us, it's a very important, particularly uh, the school we have in Parshala, uh, where a, a bigger portion of uh, study comes to visual anthropology and the critical understanding. Uh, I mean, we photographers take photographs and make some really visually engaging stories, but at the same time, when we actually go back and look at the work, there, there is a social context we deal with, especially about Edward Curtis. Shamun will be uh, giving the context. But in the school, while we discuss, we always um, find the two different extreme poles. One is the aesthetic, one is the ethics where, uh, in representation of the work. And also, um, in Pashala, we try to actually publish several different books, like uh, one book we published uh, uh, named as Camera which is like an anthology of photography where we try to translate uh, theories and different kind of interviews in Bangla. So it's a, it's a continuous process. We are trying to actually have to be, uh, start these dialogues. So I'll not be my, not making it long. So Sam is here with us. So please, Shamun. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll speak for about half an hour and then uh, I'll be happy to take questions uh, for about 15 minutes or so. I think we have 45 minutes. Um, I realize that speaking about Edward Curtis, an early 20th century uh, photographer from America, might seem a little strange um, in the context of Chevy Mela. But I'm hoping that the general uh, themes and issues that I'm going to uh, try and highlight through using Curtis, a case study, will have a, a broad relevance. And my main title, Cross-Cultural Encounters, is meant to indicate some of this, that um, my primary interest in Curtis, um, and I've recently written a book on Curtis, uh, is to do with the nature of uh, the encounter that is still visible in his work, and how we try and, in some ways, uh, articulate that encounter. And in doing so, I'm very much, um, to be upfront about it, going against the grain of much of the writing on Curtis which has itself been a microcosm of a broad trend in post-colonial photographic criticism in which the relationship of white photographers to non-white subjects, the West to the non-West, has, it seems to me, become already pretty stale. Um, it worries me that when I pick up a book on African photography and when I pick up a book on Indian photography, when I pick up a book on Native Americans, the content might be different, the fundamental critical framework is not, and it's the same story again and again about exploitation, about misrepresentation, about romanticization. These things began to bother me when I, the more I read because it seems to me that there's almost a sense of a prepackaged discourse that you simply feed content into. And um, the more I've looked into Curtis's work, the more I have felt that the relationship of aesthetics and ethics uh, is indeed intertwined rather than a separate uh, problematic. And that some of the achievement of Curtis is, I think, uh, ethically misrecognized. So I'm going to just introduce um, Curtis's work for those of you who don't know Curtis and, and briefly raise a number of questions. And that's all I can really do in 30 minutes is to open up debate rather than uh, resolve um, all the questions. Um, it's always awkward to talk about work that you have just finished because in the book I deal with eight or nine photographs and I deal with each photograph for about 50 or 60 pages. Um, so trying to give you a kind of 30 minute summary is, uh, uh, is somewhat difficult, but I'm hoping that there'll be enough material for you to um, get an idea of what I'm talking about. So Edward Curtis was an early 20th century photographer. He started photographing in uh, the United States in the region of Seattle in the late 19th century. He was a portrait photographer, a studio photographer, self-taught, had set up his own studio, and um, realized that there were a group of Native Americans uh, living near Seattle, he started photographing them, and then developed uh, an extraordinarily ambitious idea uh, 
which was that he would photograph every Native American tribe west of the Mississippi in the United States and Canada that still retained in the beginning of the 20th century some amount uh, of their traditional cultures. He thought he could do this in five years. Uh, the initial idea was to just photograph. Um, he needed money. He wanted to do this at the highest possible quality. Um, so he was going to work with photographer, which was the most expensive form of uh, photographic printing uh, in, at that time. Uh, it's the kind of stuff that Stieglitz used and the other great art artists, uh, artist photographers used in the 20th century. Um, he encountered J.P. Morgan, the financier, who partly funded his project. Um, Curtis then developed the idea of incorporating text as well as image. By the time the project was finished, it had taken him roughly 30 years to complete. And what resulted was the most expensive individual photographic project in the history of photography, and also the largest ethnographic text in the history of anthropology. So if for no other reason, those two reasons are worthy of paying some attention to in terms of what Curtis achieved. Curtis had, by the end of his project, taken something like 40,000 photographs of Native Americans, two and a half thousand of which are included in the 20 volumes and 20 portfolios of the North American Indian. When the book was published, or finished rather, in 1930, um, it was an extraordinarily expensive book. It was three and a half thousand dollars, which is one of the most expensive photographic books of all time. Unfortunately, the Wall Street crash had happened the year before, and therefore nobody was interested in buying um, a three and a half thousand dollar book on Native Americans. Um, only 250 copies were ever published, roughly. Um, many of them have been destroyed by art dealers because they ripped out the pictures and sold them individually. So around the world now, there are very few copies. So I'm already heading towards one of my points, which is that, um, and I know that there's a, unfortunately, there's a workshop going on right now as we speak on the photo book, and part of my argument is about the photo book. One of the problems of talking about Curtis is that everyone talks about Curtis because they have seen a handful of decontextualized photographs in reproductions, in coffee table books, in photographic histories. Curtis never intended his photographs to be seen that way. His photographs are organized in a particular sequence in relation to a particular text inside a book and in relation to a portfolio. If you take them out of context, you do a great deal of violence to the meaning of the photographs and how they might be perceived. The problem, of course, is that most of us do not have access to these books uh, because they belong in very high-powered research universities and they're hard to get to, et cetera. Um, this is what they look like. Um, the portfolio on the left and the, uh, sorry, the portfolio on the right and the book on the left. Each book has one uh, full page image roughly every three or four pages uh, separated from the text by tissue paper, uh, transparent tissue paper. The text almost never refers to the photographs. The photographs don't always relate to the text, which poses an interpretation problem, which is that Curtis designed a photo book in which the image and the text are equal partners, and the reader has to figure out the relationship between the text and the image, rather than having it explained. In other words, for me, the images are never mere illustrations, the way that you might get them in a textbook. They are an independent argument-making structure, which Curtis intends you to engage with as artworks. Um, this is, in the history of anthropology and in the history of photography, a unique kind of experiment in the 20, early 20th century. I know of no other book, really, that tried to do this the way Curtis does it, certainly not in um, Europe or America. This is what a portfolio looks like when it's open. Um, they're very large. That's why I put the pen there, so you can get a sense of the scale. Um, what I'll do is quickly uh, just show you, a, you know, a dozen or so pictures from uh, Curtis, so that you have an idea of um, the kind of work he does, and then um, we'll talk a little bit about Curtis. Um, so this is his most famous photograph. It's the first photograph in the first portfolio published in 1907. It's known as the vanishing race. And for most critics of uh, Curtis, this is the image that encapsulates 
everything that is wrong with Curtis. The representation of Indians as a dying romantic group, soon to disappear from the face of history as white culture becomes dominant in America. So Curtis photographs Native Americans in traditional dress when most of them were living in poverty, on reservations, in Western clothes, uh, with not enough to eat, dying of disease, uh, defeated as a military force. And yet the people we see in Curtis are dressed in traditional clothes, very beautifully photographed, very heroic, very romantic. And the argument, of course, is that Curtis is feeding a Western white mythology of the Native Americans rather than confronting social reality. Um, and here are some of the images. So the war party you see on the right is a reconstruction. I mean, Native Americans weren't like this at the time that Curtis photographed them. Uh, although there are Native Americans, and these are horses that belong to Native Americans, and they are wearing their own clothes, uh, at least in this photograph. Um, so that's a problem I would like to talk about. Um, and although there are great landscape shots and great ceremonial shots, more than roughly half the photographs out of the 2,500 are portraits. Um, and incredibly intimate, uh, there's the word that I needed to use, uh, in incredibly intimate portraits of Native Americans uh, from the time. Um, No reproduction that I've ever seen, certainly not this PowerPoint, does any justice to the actual quality of the photographers. Once you hold them in your hands, it, they just blow you away. They're so delicately printed. They're so beautifully done. Each one of these <coughs> photographs cost more to produce than a full-length book with two-tone reproductions would have cost at that time. And there are 2,500 of these, hand-printed, hand-bound into the books uh, in each volume. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. There are photographs like this as well, though, in the... In terms of reproductions, this is closer to the color tone that in the actual um, book. So the critique of Curtis is he leaves out history, he denies time and modernity to the Native Americans. He makes them into museum pieces. Um, he romanticizes them. And in that sense, he is the living embodiment of post-colonial kind of critiques of photography, that, that that's what you critique. Um, and in most histories of photography, when you have a whole chapter on, let's say, Stieglitz as the father of American photography, you have a paragraph on Curtis as the representation of um, this other trend, you know, the, that we are no longer interested in. And this is often the photograph that is evoked to, deny, uh, to, to explain why it is that Curtis uh, is such a terrible guy, really. Um, so this is the print version of this photograph. And I will now show you the negative print, uh, which is um, different. I'm assuming that you can all see the difference. You can see in between the two men, there's a slightly blurry area. And in the negative, there's an alarm clock there, which has been photoshopped out, not photoshopped, obviously manipulated. Uh, manipulations of photographs go back to the beginnings of photography. They don't come with Photoshop. They've always been manipulated. So this is the image that is used to say, well, look what Curtis did. There was one sign of modernity, and it has been removed. The clock must have been put there by the Native Americans. They wanted this to be there. And he has taken out modernism completely and made it look like a timeless photograph. Many critics have used this photograph because one critic used it in 1982, and then it's been repeated many times. Every book on Curtis quotes this. That's why I ended up writing my longest chapter on this photograph, because I think they're wrong about this uh, for many reasons. For one reason, it isn't the only sign of modernity. The figure on the left is wearing a modern shirt. It's entirely clear when you look at it in the port portfolio. The portfolio image is this big, and you clearly see it. It's not the only sign of modernity. The question really is, why did he remove the clock? Was it to deny them their modernity? 
This comes back to the issue of sequencing. If you actually look at the sequence to which this image belongs, modernity is not denied at all. And if you look at the text that accompanies this image, modernity is not denied. The text actually gives you a very harrowing account of the political experiences of the Pagan and massacres have suffered. So the violence of history is entirely present as a, as you like, if you like, a soundtrack that accompanies this photograph. Um, I also feel that the focus on the clock is in fact ethnocentric on the part of the Western viewer because it is what the Western viewer sees as the dominant object in the picture. I am absolutely sure that if these two men were looking at this photograph, they would not see the clock as the dominant object. They would see the peace pipe that is in front of the clock as the dominant object. It is not visually dominant to Western eyes, but as a sacred object, they are sitting around the most important object in their culture. It's only that Western eyes don't see that. By removing the clock, I think Curtis, to some extent, honors that cultural fact in, rather than deny it. Um, and I think that's a very complicated way of looking at what objects mean. It's also true that the clock was put there, but it's also the fact that everything else in the photograph was put there by these two men. Curtis didn't put it there. These men retain traditional objects. They retain traditional clothing. They retain a teepee. Um, and I also feel that if you put the clock in there, Curtis knows that that is what the Western viewer will focus on. If you remove the clock, the movement of your eyes becomes very different. The movement of your eyes moves between the two faces. If you put the clock there, it triangulates the vision, and you are distracted by the clock. I think there's a difference between portraiture and non-portraiture in these images. Um, also, the fact is, um, there's another image of the three of them that also had a clock in it. If you look at the sequence of the images, this is where the sequence ends. And the subtitle of this uh, photograph is A Pygon Home. But Curtis doesn't say which one is a Pygon Home. Is it the modern home or is it the teepee? Modernity is not denied by Curtis at all in this sequence. But all the critics have ignored the sequence and all the critics have ignored the text. Curtis, it seems to me, is offering you a much more complex engagement. So this, for instance, is taken as a very romantic image. You know, they weren't living on in teepees. Uh, they were all living in modern housing. Um, this looks like a classic Western from the 1930s or 40s by John Ford. Um, however, the text that goes with this image is a text in which Curtis says, when I came here two years ago, this plain was so full of teepees that you couldn't see the land for miles and miles. There were so many. Now they're all dead. This is all that's left. So suddenly, the text takes an image which to a Western viewer looks like a romantic confirmation of uh, the romance of Native American life and makes them realize that what they're looking at is genocide, that what they're looking at is actually a massacre of some kind, that these people, the, the, the crow, for instance, uh, in the years that Curtis knew them had gone, had lost 50% of their population. Um, um, this is the photograph of a man called New Chest. Again, it's a portfolio photograph from the same sequence as the one with the clock. Right? And it's a very large uh, thing. So when you hold it, you see all the details very clearly. And I don't know if you can see it, but in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a detail. So if it was easy for him to uh, remove the clock, the question really is, why does he not remove the safety pin? Um, and you can see with the blanket that has been posed, he almost frames the safety pin uh, deliberately. Um, I'm not answering all the questions, but at least there's a problematic of interpretation and no easy answer to the denial of history in Curtis's work. Um, there are all kinds of signs. He's also wearing a modern shirt, obviously, and his name is New Chest, and the safety pin's on his new chest, obviously. One can get some sense of the power of portraiture in Curtis by just looking at the way Native Americans were usually photographed by other photographers. This is not by Curtis. When Native American delegations went to Washington, D.C., they were photographed in studios as before and after negotiation photographs. This is what they looked like before, and then they became civilized because they had negotiated, and they became this. 
you know, this for me is not portraiture, it's just a picture of people. Curtis's photographs seem to me to have a very different relationship to the people he's photographing. African Americans were photographed in a totally different way. They were photographed this way. Curtis is, I think, doing something very different. Um, if it is the case that, we, as we all know, that when we don't want to be photographed, um, we all look uncomfortable in a photograph, it's just a natural bodily response, then the question is, why is it that in almost every one of the 1,500 portraits that Curtis takes, that is not the fact? Right. Uh, that in itself is something that photographic history has to account for. The other question that has been left out of Curtis uh, studies, in my view, and a lot of post-colonial studies, is Curtis spent 30 years crisscrossing America dozens and dozens of times, visiting many Native American groups many, many times. Um, he photographed thousands of Native Americans. Nobody has asked the question, what did they think of this project and why did they collaborate in it? This is a very famous photograph of one of the people who worked with Curtis as a translator and assistant in ethnographic research, himself a Crow Indian called Alexander Upshaw, worked with Curtis for five years. This is how Upshaw normally looked. And this is the way he looks in a Curtis photograph. Now, the question that has been asked by critics is, why did Curtis do this to Upshaw? The question I think they should have asked is, why did Upshaw allow this to be done to him? Because the first question, while wanting to speak for Upshaw, already denies him his agency. It is the question that is ethnocentric. It isn't Curtis who is ethnocentric. Right? Upshaw was an educated man. He was married to a white woman. He owned a ranch. He was earning money working for Curtis. Um, he had translated for world fairs. He had gone uh, to Carlisle. He had gone to uh, the Bloom School and been educated. He had become a teacher at an Indian school. This was not a guy who was going to do anything he didn't want to do. If that is all true, then the fact is that this portrait by Curtis is a collaborative effort. It cannot be what Curtis did to Upshaw. Curtis didn't hold a gun to Upshaw's head. Curtis didn't pay him thousands of dollars to dress up as a weird Indian. The other weird thing about Upshaw, and Upshaw is one of the very, very few people photographed by Curtis where I've been able to find biographical information. Upshaw had only four years before this photograph written a letter to his old school at Carlisle. Carlisle was an American Indian training school where Indians were supposed to be turned into white people. Forget their religion, forget their language, trained to be industrial workers, etc. Upshaw had bought into this completely. He thought that was the way forward. He wrote a letter to Carlisle saying, somebody has said that at the Omaha World Fair, I was seen dressed as an Indian. I would like to make it clear that I would never be seen dead dressed as an Indian. Four years later, we get this photograph. What has happened in the time? We know that Upshaw in that time married a white woman. We know that Upshaw became involved in the rise of a radical young group uh, on the Crow Reservation, many of whom had adopted traditional ways as a radical form of self-identification. So although he looks like the old folks, the fact is that Upshaw belongs to a generation that has never seen the wars and never dressed this way. So when Upshaw dresses this way, he's making a personal statement. He's not simply, his father was a warrior. Uh, he was a friend of Plenty Coup, who was one of the great leaders. Um, that question needs to be asked. The agency of the Native Americans in the making of the North American Indian is really crucial. The work of the Native American project, uh, the, the North American Indian project by Curtis, coincides with the publication of many, many, many autobiographies by Native American peoples um, in North America. Almost all of these autobiographies focus only on the traditional years of their lives. They do not focus on the reservation period because they say again and again, for us, the reservation is not who we are. That's not what was important. What we think is important is to preserve as a memory for both our people and for the white people a memory of what our culture was. I'm pretty sure that that's what the people who are working with Curtis in many cases are actually doing. I can't speak for all of them, obviously, I just don't know. This is to some extent conjecture based on circumstantial evidence. <laughs>
And I think the, the notion of agency is, is really, really important, I think. Um, uh, Upshaw is a very, very knowing guy. He has experience of photography. He has experience of negotiations in politics. He has experience of exposure to world fairs. He's done translations. He's given lectures. Um, he knows how to teach. I think it's a really complicated issue in terms of what we are seeing in this particular uh, portrait. The other question for me is, why does Curtis include a portrait of Upshaw in the portfolio? The portfolio was reserved for very special photographs. The Crow portfolio is one of the finest portfolios out of the 20. He had no shortage of fantastically great portraits of all the old Crow leaders. The only young person who doesn't belong in there is Upshaw. Upshaw has nothing to contribute to the ethnography. Upshaw is not part of the ritual culture. Upshaw is not one of his informants in that way. I think this is Curtis's way of saying thanks, basically. It's a way of honoring Upshaw to include him in that portfolio for the five years of work that Upshaw has done. Curtis doesn't say this, I'm conjecturing this, but I can't make sense of why this portrait just try and remember how much this would have cost to produce right, and to include in the portfolio when he didn't need to include it. It didn't need any beefing up. So the, in, what I'm partly trying to open up is a series of interpretive problems which I think have not been subtly asked enough about photographic history. And I think Curtis is a very good test case for this. Um, lastly, um, another, I'm concentrating on the Crow portfolio right now. This is also from the uh, crow, um, and this is a man called Shot in the Hand, one of the great crow warriors, um, one of the best portraits, I think, in the, in the Curtis portfolio as well. So on, on the one hand, this is a portfolio portrait that looks pretty much like a Victorian profile portrait. So Curtis's mode is a kind of variation of um, Victorian modes. It looks like a Western way of photographing into which Native Americans have been, in some sense, fitted. But then I found that actually there was another Crow photographer called Richard Throssell who was working on the Crow agency at the same time as Curtis, and he knew Curtis. And Curtis and he got to kind of talk to each other, and he visited Curtis's studio. Uh, he admired Curtis. Turns out that he photographed many of the same people that Curtis photographed. So it was interesting to look at how a Native American photographer would photograph the same subjects. So on the black and white is Throssell. Um, the other one is the Curtis one you were just looking at. In three of the photographs, the, the three that survive from Throssell of this man, he is always in profile exactly the same way, whether he's on horseback or whether he's uh, just sitting down as an old man. When Throssell took this photograph, as far as I know, he had not yet seen Curtis's Crow photographs. So I don't think he's copying Curtis. The question is, why does the same pose turn up? And in six out of the eight individuals that Throssell photographed, that Curtis also photographed, they strike the same pose. One conclusion has to be that they're striking the pose they choose to strike, not that Curtis has made them or that Throssell has made them. There's a further problem, which is that actually in the 19th century, the Crow were one of the people who had developed an indigenous form of art known as ledger art. When they were imprisoned by the American army, some of the Crow soldiers and warriors got hold of ledger books and some colored pencils, and they started drawing their histories in visual form, pictographic form almost, and in those histories, they always represent themselves in profile on horseback, facing that way. So I suspect that there is a reason why um, Shot in the Hand chooses this pose. It's not just a Victorian pose, it's also a pose that actually fits an indigenous notion of what the presentation of self is. When we look at this photograph, in other words, by Curtis, we're seeing a layered palimpsest of multiple meanings. It looks very different if you're looking at it through shot in the hand's eyes than it does if you're looking at it through the Victorian eyes or modern eyes. Uh, this is a photograph replete with history and of cultural encounter. This is a negotiation between Curtis and shot in the hand, it's not a straightforward photograph. All of these issues, I think, raise issues about aesthetics and ethics. If you look at the history of the visual anthropology in the early 20th century, 
Every single history of visual anthropology leaves out Curtis from its accounts. They begin with the British scholar called A.C. Haddon, who went to the Torres Straits and was one of the first to incorporate photographic records as part of ethnographic research. The photographs are totally boring. I mean, they're just re records. And the only human beings in them are little mugshot photographs of hairstyles, basically. You compare those to Curtis, that you realize that Curtis is actually doing something much more radical. He's not radical just in his encounter with Native Americans. He's radical, in my view, in combining art and science. Social anthropology, basically, as it, although it wasn't called that then, ethnographic or ethnological research, and a mode of photography that really belonged in the art salon. This is the kind of photography that uh, Stieglitz and his group are arguing for in New York as the proper home of art photography. Why would Curtis combine those? Right? Now there is a debate con in contemporary anthology about why we should bring art and anthropology back together. Well, Curtis already did it, and he did it at the beginning of the 20th, 21st century. And he did it, I think, because he insists that aesthetics, a particular encounter with a human being in the form of actual portraiture rather than mugshot, is part of an ethics of cultural encounter. And I think that is partly what, the, what his project is about. Um, and I think um, the ultimate proof for you, if you look at his photographs, has to be when you're looking at these portraits, are we looking at Native Americans who feel subjugated or who feel that they have in some ways been manipulated? Or are we looking at a much more complex uh, encounter between Curtis uh, and these people? Curtis encountered some of these people only for five or 10 minutes. He had a tent in which he would photograph with a flap that would allow him to control the light. Some of them are outdoor portraits. Um, but something very mysterious happens in Curtis's portraits, I think, which hasn't been accounted for. Um, um, and I think there are lessons uh, for the way we think about the history of photography, the way we think about post-colonial discourse, the way we are too quick to judge, in some cases, what actually in happened in terms of these encounters. Um, and finally, it's worth pointing out that when you go to Native Americans today and you go to tribal offices, most of the time, the photographs you will see up are Native uh, Curtis photographs. Um, the, the Native, whatever the Western scholars say about Curtis, his are still the photographs that Native Americans very often put up as the photographs they'd like to see. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions, um, although I can't see anyone. Uh, thanks, Shaman. That was uh, fascinating. I mean, I must admit, when when we first heard about it, I thought, not yet another Edward Curtis plantation. <laughs> and particularly coming from an academic, where you again think, not another academic. So it was very refreshing on both counts. Uh, you alluded to it towards the end in terms of how Native Americans show this work. Have you given this talk to a Native American audience, and what response do you get? I've given it, um, sorry, I've given it in um, context where there are Native American students and scholars. And actually, so far, it's been receiving pretty good responses. Uh, there's, some, you know, there's some controversy around it. Uh, the reviews haven't come out, so I'm, I'm waiting uh, with um, bated breath. Um, I think within Native American studies, the tide is turning. I think the, kind of, the kinds of positions that were taken in the 80s and 90s are softening, and I think a more complex approaches emerging. Um, so, and I think the issue of agency above all is crucial to the Native American scholars. I think they're beginning to think this. Um, more and more work is being done on the history of Native American photography so that, you know, we're finding out, for instance, that Native Americans started having work commission as early as 1840, the year after photography. The first photograph of a Native American we have is, including Hawaii, is of a Hawaiian Native American prince who was in Paris in 1840 and went to a studio and had a picture taken of himself. The Cheyenne had photographs taken of themselves in the 1890s. Uh, you know, it's, it's very soon after photography. Many Native American groups had already developed a vocabulary for photography, face in the water, um, ghost image, you know, whatever it was. They were already engaging in their language with photography um, by this time. And the Crow were the most photographed and painted people. So when Curtis goes there, they, they know what Western art is. I mean, they've, they've already got, while he's there, there are three other artists there working with him. These aren't ignorant people. They know exactly what they're getting involved in. 
Um, a, a follow up question. I mean, you, you mentioned that you'd had, you had access to several biographies. What about Curtis himself? What, was, what sort of a person was he? There are a couple of biographies of Curtis out, and he's very much promoted himself, as it were, as a kind of the uneducated Western hero, the self-made man, the kind of guy who goes out into the wilderness. You can see that in the photograph at the beginning of the thing. Um, and I think that's partly true. I mean, he was an incredibly rugged guy. He really did risk his life many, many times. He almost died several times. He lost his family as, through divorce because this project became so obsessive. He didn't make any money out of this project. He died broke. He died in the 1950s, in fact. Um, he did gold prospecting. He's a, he's a larger-than-life figure. There's no question about it. But that has often clouded the work itself. And my interest is the work itself. Uh, he did a lot of gimmicky things to promote the work, but I mean, who doesn't, right? Um, that doesn't mean that the work itself is gimmicky. He was desperate for money, he did whatever he needed to do. Um, ultimately, the work itself is the only thing that matters to me. I think that's where, what, that's what one judges him by uh, as a historical uh, fact. Um, but there are two or three biographies, uh, all of them fairly irritating to me, because they're just, they're obsessed with the guy, they're not obsessed with the work, you know, and I think that is where we need to be. Questions? <coughs> so uh, I have one question. I mean, it's yeah. a fascinating uh, perspective you have added, because we all, we also keep talking about Karthis, and uh, I was uh, talking with you before the presentation. It's more like black and white. Uh, when we talk, then it's an ethical issue of representation, or it's more like an introduction to narrative, visual narratives, especially with this medium in early 20th century. Uh, but. Uh, I would like to actually ask you about the narrative, um, because you talked about individual images, he's a crafted artist, uh, we, you also talked about the icons he used, whether it's been a modern icon or not, but when um, those narrative storytellers tell the stories, um, Cartes was actually, actually cat cataloging <coughs> their life, and it's very specific, uh, where they're staying, how they're eating, where they're moving, yeah. so it's, it's more like very introductory. Um, approach towards the narrative. It's not also showing uh, some other critical uh, engagement. I'm not always saying it's a struggle, mm -hmm. uh, but the other the issues, how they're being removed from one place to another, is more like actually introducing a yeah. very particular community. Yeah. So would you like to add something about the narrative itself? Yeah. I mean, it's true that Curtis is not interested, he says so in the very first volume and the very first introduction, that he's not going to write a history and it's not social documentary. I mean, social documentary hasn't even really been invented. Jacob Rees has done the, you know, how the other half lives, and uh, Hein is beginning to do the child um, labor photographs in America. But Curtis is not doing social documentary. So if the critique of Curtis is he's not doing social documentary and he should have, that's a weird kind of critique for me. That's not what he's doing. He's doing anthropology. Um, you may have a, a disagreement with anthropology. That's a separate kind of argument. What is interesting to me is not that he doesn't do social anthropology, uh, sorry, social documentary and does ethnology instead. What is interesting to me is that in the context of the late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, when you read most ethnographic texts, they contain no political or historical content at all. But Curtis's does. That's the way to think about Curtis, right? Is within the group to which he belongs, he is actually quite unusual. So they, there are, two, there are two kinds of text in the Curtis volumes. There's always a general introduction, which is largely written by Curtis. And then there is a series of accounts of mythology, of ceremonies, of religious beliefs, you know, classic anthropology of the time, salvage ethnography, as it was known. The main text is not written solely by Curtis. It's mainly actually written by a man called uh, Myers. Myers was the main field researcher. Myers and Curtis then edited the text together um, they then had it edited by a senior anthropologist in, on the East Coast, um, and it was a collaborative effort. The general introductions, which is where most of the social criticism is, is largely written by Curtis. And not every volume has the same amount, but some volumes have uh, an astonishing amount of angry writing about what's been done to people. So it's true that the, the narrative is, I mean, in fact, there is no narrative in the sense that he's, each volume follows a certain format. Um, 
But if you want to find out about what living conditions on reservations were like, or how uh, land had been stolen, or how treaty negotiations had been broken, you don't go to Curtis for that. I mean, if that's your, if you think everyone should do that, then of course Curtis fails. Uh, but I don't see, I don't understand that as a criteria personally. He chose to do something. Um, and what is interesting to me about that is that when you look at the Native American autobiographies, as I said, they don't do it either. They don't talk about living conditions. They don't talk about how treaties have been broken. They don't talk about we don't have enough food. Even if that's the fact, what they talk about is exactly what Curtis talks about. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a really interesting fact. Right? And then three or four of them, two by Crow leaders of the same time, end by saying, we don't want to talk about the reservation because that's just not important to us. Right? They actually say time came to an end when we moved to the reservation. For them, history is what precedes this. Um, so I think there's a much more complicated relationship between uh, Curtis and the Native Americans and what he's doing and what they were interested in. Um, I mean, he's photographing Geronimo, he's photographing Plentico. These are major, major leaders who are going to Washington to negotiate with the government and so on. The idea that he makes them do anything they don't want to do is simply absurd. It's, it's simply absurd. You know? um, Just as a follow-up, um, are you aware of any other similar, you know, photographers who have been influenced by Curtis and have done similar work. You know, is there a Curtis school of thinking, in other words, you know, uh, going forward, which has been applied to other ethnic groups or similar situations of history? Right. There were, even in Curtis's time, there were photographers who imitated Curtis. Uh, Joseph Kosuth Dixon was the most famous. He worked for the uh, uh, millionaire Wanamaker, um, uh, who had super... Uh, stores and shops and all kinds of things. Um, they, I, in my view, come nowhere close to Curtis. But nobody has attempted project at the scale and with the textual combination that Curtis actually attempted. I know of no other project. Uh, Throssell, whom I mentioned, did a series of pictorialist photographs that kind of imitate Curtis, and they're clearly influenced by Curtis. Um, you know, and subsequently there have been others, but... Um, uh, uh, even some of early Ansel Adams, uh, when he did Taos uh, photographs, there's a certain dialogue with Curtis, I think, in there. Um, so yes, but I, I think the project remains pretty unique. In my view, it is unique in the history of photography and it's also unique in the history of visual anthropology. And the fact that both the histories of photography and the histories of visual anthropology do not take Curtis seriously is, to me, just a, I mean, it's just a mystery. I don't get this, uh, why that should be the case. I cannot imagine writing the history of visual anthropology without writing a chapter on Curtis, but I have never encountered one. Uh, I mean, the last chapter of my book is partly a debate about this, so I'm trying to think about it. Um, thanks, really interesting, really interesting. I live in the uh, Pacific Northwest, just south of Seattle. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've worked with uh, American Indians both on the reservation and in the pursuit of education through the American Indian College <coughs> Fund. I moved to the Pacific Northwest in 1990. Uh, I would venture to suggest that uh, in the first five years I was given three books of images by Edward Curtis as people were trying to get me to assimilate into the region. Right. Your comments about the uh, American Indian uh, offices in the cultural centers that are now being built on the reservations, normally funded by casinos, by the way, uh, are full of Edward Curtis images. They are the only high quality, dignified images that you can bring from that period of time. So I accept your complexity argument. But what is interesting to me is that those images are now being used in the heritage centers to tell uh, a more painful story from the perspective of the American Indian people, mm -hmm. uh, who actually prefer to be called American Indians these days for some reason. It's gone back, yes. Um, but, but so now I see these images more frequently in that kind of context. Yeah. And so they're taking that. And then the other thing that seems to be happening is a new generation of, of, of young men and women are coming up <coughs> who are asserting their identity they're being encouraged to do so by a, a, a warming of the climate, if you like, although it's a hideous story for anybody who wants to look into it. Uh, 
And they're taking a lot of their cues from these old images. And in a sense, they can, they yeah. can listen to their grandparents about the, pre the cultures that ended, as you correctly say, and they can actually see examples of real human beings, real ancestors wearing them. So now the work is being contextualized in a different way. And I wondered if you had a comment on that, or I was just really compelled by your presentation. I mean, I think um, I've obviously, because I'm arguing against the grain of a certain tradition of criticism, overplayed my hand in terms of my positive argument. And that's not my entire argument. There are plenty of things that are very problematic in the Curtis, and there are many things he did, like getting access to sacred objects, which are by our standards wholly unethical. Uh, but pretty much everyone did this in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, I'm not excusing that. Because that narrative has been well told many times, I don't want to repeat it. I want to do something slightly different. Um, and I think that there is a painful story behind these. I mean, when I look at Shot in the Hand, I know that he's living at this time in this extraordinary dignity becomes for me extraordinary because Curtis gives me enough information about the horror of history from which this dignity is reasserting itself. Because at the beginning of the book, he tells me that the crow have lost 50% of the population. Right? So when I'm looking at this photograph thinking, if I was looking at this in 1930, I might already be looking at a dead person. I mean, I'm, you know. Um, it's because I think Curtis frames the dignity of these people that I think my argument is neither the romantic argument of putting these in tribal offices and saying how, you know, that's a very sentimental view of Curtis, that these are just utterly beautiful photographs, and the other side, which is that these are just horribly colonial photographs. There's a much more complex ethical and historical argument somewhere in the middle that belongs to neither end of that spectrum. And I would like, I would like to locate myself there um, and, you know, although I, I've only done work on Curtis, but the more I've worked on Curtis and then gone back to accounts of, I don't know, African photography or Egyptian photography, I'm now suspicious. I now want to dig deeper and figure out how do we get to these other histories? Uh, and they're very particular histories. They're not just colonial histories, you know. Um, and I, I, I don't see that very often. Um, so, I mean, the number of times you pick up a book on post-colonial photography and, they, you know, They'll talk about um, phrenology. They'll talk about racist stereotypes. I mean, all of that's true. I, I'm not denying that. But there's almost, it's almost too easy. I can kind of flick through the pages, and I get it. I, I, I don't have to read very far. And what I wanted to do with the Curtis is to slow it all down and say, really, you need to spend 50 pages on this photograph and really think about what this photograph is. Really look. It sounds very odd to say this at a photo festival, but if you look at most photographic critical books, if you get more than three or four lines on a photograph, you're lucky. If you get a paragraph, that's a detailed reading. I don't think that's a detailed reading. When you, when you read a chapter on a Rembrandt painting, you know, you get a chapter on a Rembrandt painting. I think some of these photographs deserve to be unpacked very, very carefully, as all photographs do. Uh, all good photographs deserve it. And we don't do that very often uh, with photographs. And I think one of the interesting things about practice and um, history of why I'm glad to be here is I think that that dialogue should exist between scholars and practitioners. There are different approaches to how one thinks about photographs. Um, it's not a separation that is particularly productive, I think. Um, so, you know. Um, yeah. Thanks, Shamoon. That was really interesting. Um, so, this comes from somebody who's completely outside of academia. Uh, what kind of prerequisites? Um, are there for someone to embark on research such as this, such as your work, you know? Um, and, and how does one begin when you don't have, you know, a foundation to start upon maybe? Um, what does it take to attract scholars like yourself uh, to less researched photographic content and archives? Um, well, I mean, obviously when I... Uh, uh, Although so much has been written on Curtis, you know, actually Curtis is one of the least researched scholars. There are two, there are two scholarly books on Curtis, if I include my own. And if you will permit me, I will. Because I think it is a scholarly book. And before me, there's a book by Mick Gidley, which is also a very, very important book on Curtis, on his kind of historical context. So that came out in the mid-1990s, and mine has just come out. So that's it. Now compare that to the number of books written on Stieglitz, or on Walker Evans or on, you know, Cartier-Bresson, 
Um, I mean, I'll make a wild claim. I think if you were to write the history of photography plainly in America in the 20th century, not including Curtis alongside the likes of Stieglitz would be a crime. I think he's that great a photographer when you seriously think about him. Um, and therefore, I think there's something wrong with the history of photography. Um, in terms of how anyone goes about this, I mean, it's, it really is an almost impossible question. I mean, one begins by reading, one begins by, above all, by just looking. Right? When I teach photography in, at a university, trying to get students to spend as much time on 10 photographs as they might spend on a Henry James novel is really hard. They think photographs are easy. You spend five seconds, you look at them, and you're through. And trying to get them to go back again and again and again and spend time with the photograph and really, really live with it over a number of days is very hard because the visual culture we're, everyone talks about our culture as a visual culture. But what that means is it's a visually illiterate culture because we take the visual for granted. Therefore, we don't think about it. Marshall McLuhan's great quote from the 1960s, the thing about goldfish is they don't know they live in water. Uh, we, the visual culture has become like water for us and are getting, the students actually, they take it so much for granted they don't think about the visual in the way I would, I would want them to think. Um, with the Curtis, there are, I mean, it depends on partly where you live, right? In London, it's actually really easy because there are two great national libraries. They're free. Anyone can walk in. Anyone can walk into the British Library and ask for this book. And they will bring it out and put it on a big table for you and they will let you look at it. It's extraordinary. That's how I began. I just literally went to the Guildhall Library thinking, why don't I go look for myself? And they put the 20 volumes on this enormous table for me and left me alone for the whole day. Um, and that's where everything began for me. I just then suddenly realized that everything I had thought about Curtis was wrong. That within those early hours, everything had changed for me. Um, with just an hour's reading. I think that's where you have to begin. You have to figure out a way to get access to material. Um, but it is hard. I think, you know, I think the, the publishing world doesn't support photography particularly well right now. Um, One more question. <coughs> Hi, Shamoon. Hi. I'm Chaitanya. Uh, about the Upshaw mystery, the yeah. photograph, I had a certain perspective and uh, I'd like to know your views on it. So I think that Upshaw had started to grow, like after spending so much time with uh, Curtis, he had started to grow a liking for his own kind, a love for his kind, like after he made so many visits, he finally started realizing what the meaning of his clan was, their existence, what the traditions and the culture meant. and. Instead of thinking like uh, it, wa it was a gift from Curtis for Upshaw, I think it was a thank you gift from Upshaw to Curtis to let him have that photograph. So right. what do you think about that? No, I mean, I, when I said at the end that I, have, I think all of these photographs need to be thought of as collaborative things, right? In other words, we need to see these photographs through the eyes of Upshaw and we need to see these photographs through the eyes of Curtis. We need to see it through the eyes of Shot in the Hand. I think there are, there are different things coming together. And one of the things I use the word cultural, uh, cross-cultural encounter is that I think these photographs are sites of encounter. And if we learn, if we develop an interpretive framework that is supple enough or subtle enough to unpack, at least even conjecturally, uh, but fairly believably, the possibilities of multiple ways of reading the photographs, then you do encounter exactly that. I think that's a very good point, that I think having worked with uh, Curtis for five years must have changed uh, Upshaw. The fact that up, because of him, but given the fact that Upshaw was originally opposed to traditional life, it also means that something must have happened to him before he encountered Curtis for him to be willing to work with Curtis on a project that he would have otherwise rejected. So we, you know, we don't know what that was, but we, we get a sense of it from the fragments of biography. The greatest loss for us is that almost none of the Native Americans who worked with Curtis left behind diaries or letters or reports. We know nothing about them, right? We have to reconstruct a kind of absent history around the photographs. So, I mean, that's what I'm doing here. I'm working conjecturally that I've seen a set of profiles. I know that ledger art exists. I know that Throstle photographs. What, what on earth is going on there, right? How do we give a plausible explanation? And I think this is, even if this truth proves to be untrue, it's plausible enough to stop us in our tracks from 
quickly reading a photograph, to at least consider other possibilities of reading what an encounter means. You know, um, there are in the negatives and in the archives uh, some set of photographs where we have ten or twelve photographs of the same individual by Curtis, and that opens up a whole other. Even if only one of them was published, the archive allows us to see a an ongoing encounter, you know, people laughing, people playing with Curtis. It's, it's an, and you know, then the question is, why didn't he include those in the archive, in, in the published version? Um, but I, I just don't want to take photographs at face value. You know, we're too, if you do that, the interpretation of the photograph is too over-determined by contemporary discourse and not historically informed enough for me. And I think you really have to kind of figure out that photographs are far more mysterious than this. They, they're opening up a history to us that um, it's a privilege to have access to in the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sean.